Okay, everybody, and um, we will now begin. This is Claudia. 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 Okay, thank you very much. So welcome everybody today. Thank you for coming. Um, so thank you for to the British Mycological Society for uh, uh, taking uh, my project into account uh, to present during these super interesting talks. Um, so today I'm going to talk about my thesis project about biocontrol of mycotoxigenic fungi by lactic acid bacteria and yeast on coffee. I would like first to present uh, myself a little bit. I started um, my bachelor in biology at the University of the Basque Country in Spain. Then uh, I did my master in biotechnology of environment and health between the University of Oviedo in Spain and Cranfield University. So just after that, I started the PhD in 2020 between uh, the University of Montpellier, specifically a research uh, lab in uh, uh, called UMR Cali Sud and uh, also the Cranfield University, uh, under the title of my project, uh, Biocontrol of Mycotoxigenic Fungi by Lactic Acid Bacteria and Yeast on Coffee. So uh, where the project began, uh, it began in France uh, in October 2020, and uh, it was thanks to the partnership that uh, France holds with the Ivory Coast that uh, I was able to take or they send the samples of coffee uh, with which um, I worked throughout my PhD. So it started in France. It uh, took uh, place there for 18 months for half of the PhD. And then I moved uh, to Granville University to continue with the PhD. Uh, you can see in the photo of Vincent Building uh, that uh, hosted uh, last April the 125th um, um, anniversary of the British Mycological Society. Uh, this a uh, very nice symposium. Um, so let's dig in. Um, so we are going to talk about coffee today, um, about specifically post-process. So the post-process of coffee, the post-harvest, let's say, consists of uh, fermentation and after this, normally drying. So it is during the drying step that there is a risk of mycotoxin because uh, there is a very huge uh, growth of fungi uh, at this point where the content of water changes from 70% to 12. And it is in this step where the uh, mycotoxins are produced. Uh, in our case, uh, in coffee, the most, uh, the, the, the main mycotoxin is ocratoxin A. It's a very uh, stable uh, uh, at high temperatures uh, mycotoxin, so not even roasting of coffee, this mycotoxin can be removed. Uh, besides, uh, ocratoxin A uh, has is uh, very uh, dangerous for health because it's a uh, cancerous and also neurotoxic between other bad attributes. Uh, besides, the presence of this toxin uh, provokes the projection of 40% of the coffee that arrives to the European border. So it has a huge economic impact for the producers of coffee that normally are developing countries. And uh, in our project, the solution that we uh, want to apply is the uh, biocontrol with lactic acid bacteria and yeast. These are safe microorganisms that also add organoleptic qualities to the coffee and, and, and are a good alternative to fungicides. Besides, during this project, uh, we are analyzing which is the effect of climate change on this relationship, this biocontrol process between the biocontrol agents and the fungi. So what is biocontrol? It's the first question that you might, uh, you might have. So biocontrol, um, it's a process between Two in our case, and in this case, a biocontrol agent and a, a microorganism that produces a specific mm, dangerous uh, metabolite or yeah, metabolite in our case. So it is a biocontrol a in the biocontrol agent could be bacteria, yeast, or fungi, and they could have different strategies against the mycotoxigenic fungi. So they could uh, compete for the nutrients and the space, they could produce uh, volatile organic compounds, enzymes, antimicrobial compounds, or uh, absorb the 
the mycotoxins, the spores of the fungi, or even the mycelium with the cell wall. These uh, kind of strategies provoke the reduction of the growth and also a reduction of the mycotoxin, either by degrading the mycotoxin, by adsorbing with the cell wall, or by, by inhibiting some of the genes uh, of the fungi that are responsible of the production of the mycotoxin. So in this project, uh, we isolated different strains of lactic acid bacteria, different strains of yeast, um, and also strains of aspergillus. Uh, the most, the biggest producer of OTA in coffee is aspergillus carbonarius, aspergillus westerdichiae, and also aspergillus ocraceus. And um, we uh, detected which was the most mycotoxigenic fungi, thanks to the experiment that appears in the photo on the right, in which you can see some kind of uh, reflection. And this happens because when the fungi produces the OTA, this mycotoxin produces reflection under a determined, determined uh, wavelength. So this way we can mm, uh, qualitatively uh, detect the production of the mycotoxin. So we have the mycotoxin and fungi, we have the strains. Now we need to know which uh, of these strains are real biocontrol agents. So what we did was a war. We just confronted both of them. To begin, we started in vitro in um, petri dishes. We just covered the petri dish with uh, the biocontrol agents, the potential biocontrol agents, and centrally inoculated the aspergillus um, species that we analyzed uh, because they were uh, very ocratoxygenic. And uh, the result showed that for the case of the bacteria fungi confrontation on solid medium, medium for the specific uh, OTA production and the fungal growth, there is a reduction uh, in, this, in these two parameters. Okay, so we can see for the OTA specific production, that is the graph on the left, that uh, in compared to the control, in comparison to the control, uh, most of the strains of bacteria reduce uh, statistically significantly um, the, the production of this mycotoxin. However, some of them uh, stress the fungi and make the fungi produce a higher quantity of mycotoxin than the control. Okay? For the case of the growth, it's the same. Uh, most of the strains reduce uh, significantly the growth, but some of them don't. So, if we also go to the other bio potential biocontrol agent, that is the yeast, we can see kind of the same results. In this case, they are more efficient. So all of the yeast that we tested, all of them uh, reduced significantly the growth of the fungi and also the production of the mycotoxin. Some of them more efficiently than others, but all of them statistically uh, significantly. Okay. So yeah, we have the biocontrol agents, they reduced, yes, some of them are biocontrol agents, but we want to know why. So we want to know, in our case, we are focusing one of the strategies that would be the adsorption. So we want to see if there is some kind of adsorption of the mycotoxin to the cell wall of the, um, of the biocontrol agent. For this, we carried out some confrontations on liquid media, in this case, and uh, we tested only the metabolites produced by the yeast and the lactic acid bacteria and the cell wall of the biocontrol agents. We saw that the supernatans, the supernatan is a section that has only the metabolites, doesn't have the cell wall, had no significant effect on OTA production and fungal growth. This means that when there is no cell wall, there is no reduction of OTA or growth of the fungi. So it is the cell wall of the biocontrol agents that have some kind of function, um, okay, by ad uh, adsorption of the mycelium or adsorption of the mycotoxin, okay? We wanted to dig deeper uh, in these uh, results for the yeast, and we confronted the yeast um, and analyzed uh, which is the... Um, the, the interaction and the scanning electron microscopy um, with the fungi. So we saw at day three uh, that when we put in confrontation one of the yeast with the fungi, the yeast attached to the to the mycelium and they produce 
um, some kind of um, they reduce the the, the targency of the of the mesothelium. No, we can see in the in the control on the image on the right a very nice mesothelium mesothelium that is healthy. You know, like it's it's uh, turgent. And on the middle photo and on the left one, we can see that the mycelium is not in the best uh, health. And we can also see that the yeast, in fact, they attach to the, to the mycelium. As well, in this project, we didn't only focus on the biocontrol, since we had a very nice se uh, set of samples of coffee. We wanted to also analyze which is the diversity of these samples and which is the amount of mycotoxin that is naturally on the samples. So uh, the samples we received uh, have been processed uh, in different groups. Okay, the, we can divide them into main groups. Uh, one of the groups is the dry processed coffee. The other one is the semi-dry. The difference between these two groups is that one of them um, was submitted to uh, soaked soaking between uh, during the night, so it was wet in water during the overnight, and the other one didn't. As well, there are some differences between the processes because some of the coffee uh, was uh, stored in kind of mountains, heaped, and other uh, uh, coffees were just dried directly um, on the on the floor or on bamboo uh, tables. As well, we received uh, samples of fresh coffee before uh, any process. The, regarding the OTA concentration of the samples, we saw that uh, it is the samples that have been stored in these kind of mountains that present most the biggest quantity of mycotoxin. And this could be as well because in the case of uh, the AEHDP, that means extended heaps dry process, because it's extended, because it takes longer to, to get to the dry step, there is more time uh, that makes the coffee samples more prone to contamination with other kind of microorganisms. Uh, as well, um, we can see in the case of non-extended, but the case of HDP, that is heat dry process, so just the small mountains, that there is also a, a high quantity of mycotoxin. In the case of just dry process or um, the, uh, the HDP, sorry, I, conf I was confused just before. Well. So in the case of just dry processed, uh, we can see that there is a lower uh, quantity of mycotoxin. Okay, so what did we do to get uh, to uh, to do the metabarcodine analysis? Okay, so let's go to the protocol step by step a little bit in a simple way. So we first uh, prepare the samples, then we extracted the DNA from the samples. We quantified the DNA to do a quality check as well to see if the DNA is, is uh, good enough to, uh, for, meta for further uh, steps. Then we did the PCR amplification of the regions that belong uh, to the fungal and the bacterial diversity, to be able to see which is the diversity of uh, bacteria and the diversity of fungi. Then we took our samples to the platform for uh, sequencing, and from the platform we got the raw FASQ files, so, okay, so with these FASQ files, we process them in a way that we were able to see with our things to the, the use of the different packages in RStudio, uh, the, we could analyze the diversity. So our first results, so the alpha diversity that, um, of the samples, we could see for the case of the bacterial diversity, that uh, there is a higher diversity on the cell and there is a higher dominance on the bean. Okay, so this makes sense since the cell is uh, exposed to many other microorganisms that are that are out. Uh, it makes sense that it has higher diversity, and it also makes sense that there's higher dominance on the bean because there are less less uh, there is less diversity, but a higher dominance. So it is inside where there are they, they, they have access less quantity of uh, different species of bacteria. For the case of fungal diversity, we saw that in the cherry there is a higher diversity and in the cell there is a higher dominance. Okay. For in with this um, with this metabarcoding technique is very powerful and you can also um, include different um, properties of the process. Okay. So 
we could compare the samples that were uh, under soaking conditions and those that were not under soaking, under soaking conditions. We saw that the no soaked samples have more diversity and the soaking samples have more dominance. So this makes sense as well <laughs> because um, when uh, you are, when uh, coffee is submitted to, to uh, soaking, when it's under water, there are some anaerobic conditions that um, advantage the growth of anaerobic bacteria. So there is a higher quantity of some specific bacteria. So there is a higher dominance of those ones that are anaerobic. Okay. For the case of fungi, we saw that soak samples present higher diversity, but only for cherries, and no soak samples present higher dominance. So the same, no soak samples, so samples that are drier, let's say they haven't had this wet uh, process. So um, because fungi prefer a lower water activity, it makes sense that the, there is a higher dominance of the fungi uh, in the, in the, in the non-soaked coffee because there is a better conditions for the fungi to develop. So there is a dominance of the fungi and the dominance of a small group of, of the of fungi. Okay, so in conclusions, to finish, um, I have just three main points uh, to conclude. So uh, 17 of the yeast isolated during the project had the capacity to reduce the growth and the production of OTA against one strain of aspergillus section nigri. 10 bacterial strains isolated from Ivorian Coast coffee uh, had the capacity to reduce growth and OTA production by aspergillus section nigri. And regarding the, the conclusions of metabar coding, there is a higher bacterial diversity on soaked coffee and the higher fungal dominance on non-soaked coffee. Okay, so I hope I didn't go too fast. I would like to finally thank and acknowledge all the support from my uh, supervisory uh, team uh, from France and from the UK. So you can see the photos, uh, Angel Medina Valla, Professor Angel Medina Valla, Dr. Carol Berghiki Baesen in Crowfield, and uh, Professor uh, Sabine Scorgalindo in France, Dr. Angelique Fontana and Dr. Caroline Straub uh, are the, the main team of supervisors, but also uh, Noel Durand, Vincent Chouchoua uh, and Carla uh, have been uh, of great support uh, through, the, through the thesis. I would like just to let uh, you know that uh, both of the, uh, the um, uh, teams have a Twitter account in case you want to follow them. And uh, well, thank you for your attention and any questions? Thank you very much, Claudia. That was wonderfully entertaining. Um, any questions anybody has, if you could put them in the chat facility, we'll try and address them now if you have anything you want to ask, Claudia. Okay, this is Emma at the BS at BMS. So um, there's a couple of questions come through already, Claudia. So first of all, from Suzanne, is there specific lactic acid bacteria able to detoxify the mycotoxins? Mm, I wouldn't know if it's detoxification or it's another process because detoxification happens when the mycotoxin is already produced. Uh, it detoxifies the coffee, but in this case, it might be biocontrol. So what it does is that reduces the, prevents the production, let's say. So we don't know yet if it's one or the other okay. for the case of lactic acid bacteria. Okay. Another question from Janet. Uh, lovely talk, thank you. Have you tested the ability of your biocontrol agents to limit growth of your mycotoxigenic fungi when infecting the coffee fruits? Yeah, that's uh, some experiments that I will uh, carry, out, carry, on, carry out in the following months. Uh, yeah, it's the last phase. So we first try it on in vitro, then uh, in uh, in vivo on uh, coffee. So yeah, it's it's uh, part of the planning. Okay, um, I have a question um, for you, Claudia, and this comes from my ignorance of the uh, of the research area. Um, so early on, uh, you said that you'd observed. Um, that there was some kind of uh, biocontrol by lactic acid bacteria or yeast, and you noted that yeast reduced growth and mycotoxin production. And then you were asking why? 
or how that is happening. And your first step was to examine whether there was absorption taking place. Why was that the first thing that you looked at? Yeah, that's a very good question. So literature, uh, I did an extensive literature review and most of the people was seeing this kind of absorption properties of the, of the cell wall. And um, I focus on it because it has many different options. So it can be absorption of the spores, of the mycelium, or the ocaratoxin. So I thought that it was the one that would give a more kind of a game. But also, there can be combination of different strategies. There could be competition for nutri nutrients and space combined with uh, absorption. Or, um, well, in this case, I tried the supernatans uh, and there were no results. So there might, there might not be enzymes or metabolites. So, yeah, I went this way because when I tried the supernatans and cells, I saw that the only the cell walls were really like having some kind of extra impact. I see. I see. OK, thank you. And um, I think possibly we might move on to the next speaker. Um, and the next speaker Norman. is yeah, the next speaker is Nilu from a PhD student from King's College, and uh, I'll hand you over to Nilu now. Thank you. Um, can you see? Oh, God. I'm going to take the laser pointer off because it's not helping me. Can you see? Um, can you see the participant list? No, we can see your slides, that's fine. Okay, hold on. And we can see you as well. Oh, we can't see your slides Sorry. now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Mm -hmm. There's always one that causes trouble. Hold on. <laughs> Um, thank you for inviting me for this talk. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you a whistle-stop tour of um, what happened during my um, thesis and what we initially set out and how we ended up trying to benchmark um, the microbiome. So a little bit about me. Um, I was at St George's University when I kind of fell in love with microbiology. Um, I then went on to London School of Hygiene, where I went to Imperial and I did a lot of work on Staph aureus and uh, subcolonies um, in pacemakers. I worked in Public Health England, trying to assemble um, next generation sequencing um, in 2014 um, as a routine diagnostic. And then I went to um, Centre of Clinical Microbiology as a research assistant there for three years, um, where I was moving away from microbiology and more doing bioinformatics, which kind of spurned my interest in doing my thesis. Um, so here above, you can see uh, Saeed's group and you can see uh, Dave's group. So the Shoei and the Moyes lab. Um, I've just finished my um, thesis and PhD is over, um, but I'm currently actually in UAE because I'm doing a postdoc at NYU at the moment. But let's talk about fungi. Let's talk about the microbiome, actually. So as you know, microbiome um, was introduced in 2010. And from 2015, there was like a huge growth spurt of lots of information about the human microbiome. Now, we know the microbiome uh, essentially can be affected by our genetics, our diet, ethnicity, environment. However, we have a, a lot more factors, such as the training of our immune system, how often we were unwell, um, our resistance to drugs, the therapeutic, um, therapeutic drugs that we've taken that can all affect our human microbiome over age. Now, there's been um, a lot of papers um, who focused on microbiome look with um, 16S, ITS. Um, but when I came to looking at the microbiome, I want to actually create um, a mathematical model with all the fungal species speaking to each other, kind of look at the interaction and signaling. And then I realized that everyone's idea of what was in the microbiome was very, very different. 
Um, so I set out to grab some, you know, um, multiomics data, metagenomics data, um, tra uh, transcriptomics data, metabolomics data, and I realized there wasn't any without any PCR or any ampli amplification. So this kind of, um, so uh, just a quick overview, you can see microbiome was actually less than 0.04% of um, the research done in the microbiome space. I think virome has overtaken us. Um, and Ganome in 2010 kind of highlighted all the species, um, the oral, the lung, the gastro and the skin, um, the genuses um, that we see in the microbiome, which is important, especially candida, because it's the most common and it's something that I took on um, when I did my main part of my project. Now, I wanted to optimize the shotgun metagenomics pipeline because this is what was done in microbiome. What it means is without any ampli uh, amplification steps, we're able to kind of grab all the fungal genes and identify um, what fungal species. So we can grab a lot more than what's in the primers. I'm not actually gonna show you this work, um, though it's actually been written up and I'm just adding a few more samples just to bulk up the paper, only because of the interest of time, because I've got a lot more to show you afterwards. Um, so essentially what I did in order to get this optimized pipeline was I created mock community in laboratory and I grew three different types. Um, and then I extracted with lots of different kits, but I ended up using a chemical kit, which takes about two to three days. And I, um, I took a um, commercial kit, but I adapted it a little bit to make it more efficient for microbiome. I sequenced it on True, um, True Seek Alumina. And then I placed my in-house uh, catalog, which will be publishing soon, uh, into Meteor. And then I compared it against the only other uh, packages that are available to look at microbiome, which is microbiome scan. Number two came out this year, and Metaplan three, which also came out this year in January, which only has 110 um, species. And what I did was I compared all of them to look at the accuracy. And then I went back into laboratory to do some validation. And I also added other people's data to kind of have an overview. From this work, I realized that it is possible to have PCR, uh, live and prep, free kind of shotgun sequencing. So we can remove the biases from primers uh, and any random errors. We were able to, by fixing this pipeline, we were able to then apply it to a huge clinical study, which I'll show you towards the end when I show you clinical application. Um, and we also were able to put it in fecal transplant data. We've got it in a lot of clinical trials now um, with a lot of data to kind of look at. And it's for everybody to kind of use. And we just put it into a um, next flow so that anyone could just press go and it should um, work. That's what we're working on for the paper at the moment. Um, we found that our annotation was much more species level specific based on our mock community comparison compared to what's available currently. And also, um, I can't wait for this paper to come out to, so that everyone can start using it and make uh, microbiome research much more easier. So I wanted to understand host microbiome interaction. And we thought a great way to look at this is metabolism because it's actually chemical interaction that's taking place. Now, the idea was to take one of the uh, genuses and we thought okay let's go for candor because we don't know what's there and candor seems to be present in all microbiome in like as a majority so candida another reason was because candidi um candidemia um candid some species cause candida mortality some don't and we found that it was candida albicans grabrata and oris that caused the most mortality and candemia which i refer to as invasive here because of how it affects our population. Um, I actually took 49 strains, all the strains available in NCBI at the time, and I was able to show that it was representative of the world. And um, you can see the paper here that was literally published, I think last month. Um, and what we did was we kind of looked at invasive and non-invasive together. And now the idea to look at interaction and metabolism we need to actually have some functional annotations. What do the genes mean? What um, What is the proteins? What is the enzymes involved? What's the metabolites involved? 
Um, I don't, um, Keg database is really famous. Most people use, it's like Keg orthologs, which are genes related to reactants, related to metabolites, um, related to enzymes, which then you can map the metabolic pathway. When I applied this, I actually saw no difference across any of the species. And this is, you know, a well done, you know, it's got 128 species in the database, which was quite worrying to see. But I wanted to dig in deeper. So this kind of led me to actually create Biofung. But before I talk about Biofung, um, I want to talk about what I did. So I took 49 different species from NCBI and I applied Biofung, which is um, the tool that we created that I will talk about in the next slide. We, to get gene information, like um, pathway information. We did um, PFAM, which is protein family information, and we did carbohydrate enzyme um, um, annotation as well. And we did some data analysis, um, enrichment analysis. But in order to, because this is all predictive because it's functional annotation, we wanted to actually go back into the laboratory and confirm this. So we then took eight candor species that were isolated from patients, um, three of which were invasive species, so that's Panda albicans, Grabrata, and Oris. And we were actually, we and the rest of them were non-invasive, and we actually performed metabolomics in order to kind of map and integrate um, the data so we can explore this idea. Now, Biofung, what did I do? So we created a database called Biofung because what we it wasn't specific enough for us. So what we did, we kind of passed it, we did multi-sequence alignment, and we actually created seed clusters for each of the genes and its functionality so we can better map it. And the only other database out there that was very similar was from Chalmers Institute in Sweden. So um, we compared how good was ours compared to what's existing out there. And we show a lot more coverage we're seeing 2,000 more um, kind of annotation compared to um, the 800 they found and the overlap. And when I looked at, okay, so we know that there's differences in the two available catalogs. So how specific is, um, uh, so I took these specific pathways to see how specific can, um, our annotations are. I found that ours was very specific because these are yeast related functions, whereas their uh, database didn't have anything. And sake of argument, we also tried to compare it with keg what was already available. So I took aspergillus and I did annotation on aspergillus species and I looked at what's the coverage with biofung compared to keg and we had a lot more coverage. So Okay, so we've actually done biofung. We applied it to all our 49 species, and it was really nice to see that in the total coverage of Candida, we were getting the gene level of um, annotation that we expect, like a, uh, any living organism will have amino acid, carbohydrate metabolism, lipid metabolism as the most important and you know the most functioning we also saw that across pfam clan now pfam is a very messy database so what i did was if you look into my paper you can uh, grab the annotation but i basically associated them to functions so it's easier to understand um, based on carbohydrate lipid amino acid protein sexual metabolism and then i also did carbohydrate enzyme level annotation which was interesting where we saw a lot of uh, substrate converters involved in starch breakdown cellulose breakdown and polysaccharide, which is understandable because of the cell walls. Now I had 49 species and I looked across all of them and I was thinking, oh, it'd be a really good idea to see, hold on, in the metabolism of fungi, how much of it is actually part of its core genome and how, many of, how much of it is a part of its accessory genome? Accessory genome means it's acquired either evolutionary or from the environment, we don't know. We're don't, not sure of the source, but not all of them have it and it's not core part of the genome. And we found metabolism was relatively more in the accessory genome and actually little um, functioning with core metabolism. And the most was carbohydrate metabolism, which was very interesting. Um, when we looked at enzyme converters, um, we actually found that um, they were more part of the core genome. However, um, enzyme converters for sugars and xylem was actually converted. And interestingly, we actually um, looked into um, the cell wall um, and what type of enzyme converters were there, which we expected mannan, chitin and glycans for candida, obviously. So now let's kind of look at 
what happened between the invasive species, which was kind of albicans, glabrata, or as compared to the rest of the um, other uh, non-invasive species as we class them here. And what's interesting to find is that there were some carbohydrate enzymes that were actually um, more enriched in invasive than non-invasive. So if we come down here, I've highlighted it better, we've got a copper oxidase substrate coberta, we've got a GH66. Now, this is actually a uh, been already associated to oral plaque formation, and it's um, also been considered as a uh, predictor for oral disease. Um, so it's interesting that fungal species has this enzyme as well, and the paper actually related bacteria to this, but also fungi might have a, a potential um, relationship with uh, this as well. GH95 is associated with mucin breakdown. But what's interesting is GH43 has never been associated to any bacteria, humans or anything or plants at all. So it's actually a very fungal specific marker here. Um, overall, what we did see is that with um, keg annotations, we actually saw there was more amino acid metabolism pathways that were enriched in the invasive. And that was also the case when we looked at um, amino acid um, protein families with the PFAM of protein associated um, processes that are happening. And so what I did was I actually took um, the species and I compared AGUA, non-AGUA, and what I did was uh, I plotted um, the differences between AGUA and non-AGUA, with AGUA meaning invasive, sorry, I called it uh, Albicans glabrata oris, and it was actually enriched to see that there was glutathione, fructose, histidine, fatty acid. Fatty acid is well known and um, in the process of a lot of investigation, but there was a lot of amino acid processes. Now I know this figure shows that it's only percentage coverage and that you can't see much difference, but in the actual paper I've updated this figure and I didn't realize I had such an old figure there, um, but there is definitely increased enrichment in um, the amino acid or these pathways in the invasive species. And because this is a functional annotation prediction, what we needed to do is go and clarify this with metabolomics. So what I did was I, grow, uh, I grew my species and at a mid exponential rate when the fungal uh, species were most active, I took a extract of extracellular uh, metabolites, which is basically right next to the um, pellet. And I was able to extract uh, metabolites. And um, these were the classes that were highlighted in metabolomics. Um, we saw a lot of cholines, amino acids, triglycerides, which is all associated and known with fungal species. Now, what was most interesting is here that there were some species, these are the top 10, there were 20, very interesting. A majority of them were actually amino acids, um, metabolites. So we saw a lot of spiramine, spiramidine, choline, phosphocholine, lipophosphocholine, and a lot of fatty acids that were significant in invasive species uh, compared to non-invasive species. So what we did then is I kind of mapped it um, to um, pathways. And you can see in blue, I highlighted uh, the part functional pathways that we predicted from annotation and enrichment analysis. I then added um, red dots are basically where the metabolomic showed enrichment. And what I did was I went back into laboratory and I did gene expression of these genes um, in this pathway to kind of see is there expression of these. And the and then I actually found they were in um, they were highly expressed genes in these pathways for this invasive species. Now I wanted to actually test um, other species like the non-invasive, whether the expression was there. However, they're all still hypothetical genes and it's not actually been annotated um, well enough for um, me to use these um, genes I've created to test, but Candor African shows that there is definitely enrichment in these pathways. And I did use a um, negative control as well for other genes that we didn't see and um, it was within the control. Now, what we understood from this is amino acid metabolism is a major contributor to pathogenesis of these uh, three invasive species that seems to have a lot of um, antifungal resistance. Now, amino acid is actually being investigated a lot. A lot of people are looking into amino acid permeases um, of interest. And it was nice to see that we were also seeing this from functional annotation and metabolomics. Now the caseines, now the um, GH43-8, um, which is a, a 
xylone um, substrate converter can be a potential biomarker for fungal infection. But we, um, what I did show is that this has been tested and the substrate um, from this work can be affected, but we need to go back and actually validate this, that we have found this, like do a little assay. Um, and the fact that we found fatty acid biosynthesis was also interesting because right now what they're trying to do is target the fatty um, acid pathway to actually cre create drug targets to aid antifungal drugs that we currently have for better susceptibility. So it's interesting that we found this also in invasive. So that's something that's happened. Now, choline um, metabolites are found in humans, but obviously we don't produce it ourselves. So it's interesting to find that maybe candida that's residing in our microbiome actually may have a role in this as well um, which has never been associated before and we're not sure how um, this is because there's a lot of uh, argument in the community does microbiome exist is it a transient is it based on diet alone or is it genuinely a stable community which I'm actually um, proving with my optimization paper because I have like um, time um, time series of um, patient samples where I can show stability of the fungal um, population. Um, and what was most interesting is the fact that polyamine metabolism um, came up and polyamine um, metabolites are actually being used in anti-aging because it actually causes cell arrest. And so there's an idea of now we know the metabolic pathway, if we can narrow it further down, we can actually do metabolic reprogramming where we can actually use these metabolites to kind of um, cause cell arrest in cancer. So that's something someone else is doing in the group looking at cancer and certain metabolites and pathways. So that's like one of the major works I did. And I'm just gonna do, I don't know if I'm running out of time or not, but I'm just going to quickly show you clinical application of the pipeline that we created. So I was kindly donated um, from uh, Vish Patel, Dr. Patel, um, with 200 patient samples of healthy liver samples. So these are oral samples, oral microbiome and gut microbiome, so fecal samples. Um, of healthy, stable liver, which is basically like slowly they're having stenosis and fibrosis is occurring, decompensated liver where there's advanced fibrosis and there's irreversible kind of impact of having complete liver failure and acute liver failure here where um, the patient has literally, the liver has died and in most cases these patients did pass away. So what's interesting, okay, child poo score, let me tell you about this clinical marker. This is actually currently used in the hospitals right now. So if you're healthy, you're not even on the scale at all. If you have a stable liver, which I showed you where the stenosis is starting to occur, your marker around five to six, we saw a good frequency of fungal microbiome. What I'm trying to show here is we actually saw an increase when it came to decompensated liver, um, increase in fungal um fungal genes, uh, so fungal species when it was decompensated liver, but then actually when it was acute liver failure, when the patient's liver started to die off, this also reduced. So the richness of fungal species also uh, reduced. And what's interesting is that we're seeing this pattern and we continue to see it. So I did a phylum level, genus level and species level, and I actually saw significant, um, statistically significant increase and decrease in genuses. So I saw in oral, it was fusarium, and in the gut, I saw it was candida but it's not shown here because there's 256 fungal genuses so it's not shown but I will show you better. What was interesting for us to do is to see is there a massive difference between control and liver and we can't see a clear separation here. Obviously the worse the disease gets we're seeing cluster separation but there is an overlap and this must mean that um, the liver's relationship with the fungi or the microbiome um, actually must be closely related. So what we're thinking here is that as the liver is healthy and well, there's a synergistic kind of relationship, but as decompensated liver happens, which we're seeing an increase, is where the immune system is declining, opportunistic fungi is increasing. And when it comes to decompensated liver, as the liver, uh, the hepatocytes are dying, um, the fungal fungi doesn't have the nutrients. So the um, fungi is actually reducing enriching in diversity and most of them are coming out. So that's what we're thinking that's happening and what we understand. 
from speaking to other clinicians as well, because what they do is they just throw antibiotics onto patients. But what was nice to see that the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome did cluster away from each other. Um, so I wanted to kind of ask, is the oral or the gut microbiome a better predictor in, um, in liver disease stage, like is my patient getting worse? And what's a predictor? Oral microbiome, um, looking at the species, or is it gut microbiome? And actually, machine learning um, with random forest actually showed us that oral microbiome was actually a better predictor. Now, interestingly, so what I did was here, um, I mapped Shannon's index um, to kind of see, okay, across these disease stages, what's happening to fungal um diversity you can see it's actually decreasing you can see this in gut microbiome and saliva and um, what was the most interesting is we have species level annotation with our work so we actually found that in the gut microbiome you can see that candida albicum actually increases in abundance as the patient um, is heading towards acute liver failure and this is also true for candida parapsilosis but this wasn't for any other candida species with Fusarium species, I found Fusarium solani in the oral microbiome was increasing. Um, and then I had uh, Fusarium species. So these were genes that weren't allocated to specific species, but just overall Fusarium. So it's not species level, but genus level, we were also seeing. And these are separate from these um, genes. So it's nice to see that we can find candida albicans in the gut, which is what literature and what other people have investigated and seen. But we're here saying that Fusarium is actually quite interesting, especially because oral microbiome seems to be a better predictor of um, liver disease. Now, um, overall, um, so this has gone into a paper which is in uh, review at the moment. We're showing that there seems to be compositional changes in microbiome as um, a patient gets towards acute liver failure. And we're finding that the oral microbiome is better at predicting liver disease status, um, and particularly by looking at Fusarium species. Um, I want to thank a lot of people. So we've got uh, SAID's lab, uh, uh, please follow them. Um, they do um, share a lot of papers with bioinformatics and tools you can use. Um, David Moy's lab, um, which is uh, working heavily on a lot of um, microbiome and fungi work. Um, so please do follow them on Twitter. I want to thank um, people at SciLife Lab, um, people at INRA in France, um, uh, uh, Dr. Patel for all his samples, Jens Nelson, who's been a great advisor, and Lars Estrand um, in Carolis Institute. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you, New. That was a very, very interesting complicated presentation but <laughs> sorry uh, no 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 don't apologize it was riveting um anybody who has any questions could you again as before put them into the chat facility and we will try and address them in the next few minutes thanks norman so there's a couple of questions come through already so first of all um from angela angela says what do you mean by invasive candidiasis i'm a gp also a george's graduate and most candida infection is fairly superficial and involving mucous membranes only. Invasive, invasive systemic candidiasis is very rare and mainly in the immunosuppressed. Okay, so um, with candidemia, we're looking at septic candida patients. So all the eight clinical samples I had were from patients um, that attended King's College Hospital who had uh, septic infection. So that's where the candidemia, when I looked, I did a massive literature review. So I have a review paper out where we looked at um, how prominent it is. Um, we found that these the whole idea of um, we didn't know how to kind of group them or target them or to how to understand candida species. And what we naturally found was that candida candidemia is rare. You are right, Angela. But what were the most uh, contributing factor to candidemia? Um, so we found it was these three species. And so we grouped them into AGA, so Albicans Corpata Oris, and we wanted to see the difference. Why are these causing more infection than the rest? Why are these are the ones with the most antifungal drug resistance than the other candida species? What have they gained or evolved or what 
genetic metabolomic processes have they gained um, compared to the rest? And so what we did was we based it on candidemia mortality. I mean, I did look at um, candelicin producing. I did look at um, true hyphae, non hyphae, but this is where the data kind of led me because um, it kind of like grew. So I let the data lead me, not, but I did do a lot more analysis in my thesis, which is also published that you can see online if you want to read more. But um, from all the literature review, is these were the most contributing factors. Thanks, Niri. Um, another question from Janet. Uh, lots of data, thank you. She says, when you were talking about the microbiome, are you referring to the gut microbiome in particular? If so, do you believe C. auris is part of this? My understanding is that it wasn't. Uh, uh, Candor Oris. Um, yes. So, I when I'm talking about here, I actually did the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome. I actually did some blood as well, um, but we couldn't isolate very well from um, patient uh, plasma samples. Um, so, Candor Oris, no, it's not actually a part of the gut or the oral, but we're actually seeing these species um, when we do the annotation. Um, so we know it's definitely a part of skin. So I think the first case of Canada Oris was a part of the inner ear of the skin. Um, but when we come to this data where I did clinical application, where I actually look at human patients, we actually didn't see Canada Oris because we didn't actually um, expect it to be there and it wasn't there. Um, I didn't actually share the optimization results. So you can't see it will answer better in this work I've done and I, I've actually found more geniuses than expected and I had to go back into lab to validate this but um, Candor Oris wasn't one of them and if it is it will probably be in skin but um, there's another member of staff who's looking into skin microbiome so um, it's not something I specialised in and no we don't expect it in the gut. Thanks Nili. Um, just one more question before we move on to our next speaker um, from Linda. Linda says, there is evidence of anti-inflammatory properties in naturally occurring beneficial gut fungi. Is there more information being sought about this and its relation to disease and health? So um, this is where I actually came in to, we, so I got funded, I was very lucky to get a lot of grants um, from Yakult and Probiotics to go to different conferences. It's because our idea was to actually look at if there's metabolite that would be actually good for us. At the moment, there's a lot of Bacteria, um, bacteria uh, lactobacillus and lots of other bacteria, but actually fungi might be a better indicator because actually there's um, a lot of fungi naturally that we won't react. So I personally have IBS and I actually react to all the probiotics out there. Um, I've even been in clinical trials about it, but actually we thought that fungi would be a better and the metabolites in fungi would be better. And that's where we started out to do a mathematical model, look at communities, how it interacts, and then basically look at human and whether it's possible Possible. However, because we saw that the microbiome and the way it was being researched wasn't well done and we needed to create databases, pipelines, my work kind of shifted that way, though I did start the process and our lab does focus on the diet and the microbiome and how to have a healthier um, and we are looking at diseases. So um, SAID's lab focuses on cancer. Um, they focus on um, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, obesity, cardiovascular. So there's a lot of research out there. Not in fungi yet, um, but hopefully this lays the foundation for everyone to go on, have these tools to make it easier for them to do. Super, thank you, Neelu. Norman, would you like to move on? I would, and our last speaker of this evening is Nathan. And Nathan, I hand, hand this over to you. Oops. Thank you very much. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. yes okay, perfect. So thank you very much for the invitation to talk tonight uh, to the British Mycological Society. Um, I am Nathan Schouteet and I'm a PhD student in Ghent University in uh, the research group Mycology of Professor Mieke Verbeken. Um, my research topic is about uh, mycoparasitic basidiomycetes. Um, just mycoparasitism, what it is, um, it's actually a fungus, simply said, eating another fungus, a fungus which uh, derives nutrients from another fungus. On this picture you can see the slimy mass. 
the slimy mosses um, Acola cogloria species, which parasitizes on this um, white background fungus. That's uh, Peneophrella pubera, that's um, a crust fungus decaying the branch, which you see in the background. And Basidiomycota, you may know as um, the group which uh, forms these typical mushroom like uh, fungi. So, first, I would like to see uh, to say some, some things about um, Basidiomycetes uh, structure and systematics. What makes actually a Basidiomycete a Basidiomycete? Um, for most taxa, that is because the um, sexual uh, um, reproduction, the karyogamy, so the, uh, the merging of the two nuclei, uh, happens in the basidium, in, a, in the cell which is a basidium. And already a long time ago, um, Patouillard was a French mycologist, and he was actually the first one to use um, the basidium as an important character to classify um, different groups of basidiomycetes. And he actually created two major groups, the heterobasidiomycetes and the holobasidiomycetes. The heterobasidiomycetes, they are generally, um, they have basidia which are uh, divided into multiple parts. They are septated. That's why they're called heterobasidiomycetes. And that's contrary to the holobasidiomycetes which have basidia which um, consist of just one cell. And during the course of this uh, presentation, we will see um, that it's important somehow because um, the uh, mycoparasites that we will discuss um, in different groups, they are characterized in general by different types of um, basidia. So those in uh, Puccinio mycotina, they will have these transversely septate basidia and mycoparasites from Tremelomycetes, which is the most species group, um, they will have in general, more this um, uh, longitudinally subtated basidia. So, just to put it a bit in perspective, about uh, 41,500 species are known in Basidium mycota, but only two, roughly 200 of them are mycoparasites. So, the currently known species diversity of mycoparasites is very low, but phylogenetically, they are very widespread, so we find them in two subphyla, in the Agarico mycotina and Puccinio mycotina, um, with the bunch, like the lion's share of mycoparasites, they all belong to the, to the Tremelomycetes. Um, Nathan, may I, I inter Nathan, may I interrupt yeah. for one moment? You have a small um, window appearing in the, in the top of your screen that is just obscuring. Mm. That's, yeah, if you could just reduce that. Oh, Perfect, thank yes. you. Perfect, thank you. So um, I will just um, spend one slide on mycoparasites and agaricomycetes. So in the agaricomycotina, we have mycoparasites and agaricomycetes and tetramelomycetes. Agaricomycetes, they, they contain only very few, um, very few mycoparasites and one of the most uh, well-known examples is for uh, this Pseudoboletus parasiticus. And it's thought, um, or it's assumed that it is a parasite on um, the mycelium of the scleroderma species. Um, the interaction me mechanism is actually not known. Um, and um, this, this species, it, they only form this, they only have a filamentous hyphal stage in which they form these fruit bodies. Um, and there are a few other species like Entoloma abortivum, and, uh, which is also from Agaricomycetes. They can really um, cause the deformation of their host, um, but these are very extreme rarities. Tremelomycetes, they contain actually the uh, most of the species uh, of mycoparasites. Here you can see what, uh, one of the most well-known and common ones, it's Tremella mesenterica. It's a parasite of um, Peneophora species, which are crust fungi on different um, wood substrates. Um, you can see this tremella is growing a little bit further from the Peneophora, which, which is this, or, uh, this purplish layer. But actually the um, interaction happens at the contact of the mycelia 
of uh, both species in the wood. If you microscope this um, tremella, this is a drawing from uh, the British mycologist Peter Roberts. Um, you can see that tremellum, tremellomycetes, mycoparasites, they have a little bit more um, complex um, characters about their life cycle um, because they, you can see this is a basidiospore, spore, but this basidiospore spore, this can germinate by budding. So they actually have um, um, a yeast stage. They, they not only have the hyphal, the filamentous stage, but they also have a yeast stage. So they alternate and that's indicated by this dimorphic life cycle. And here you can see um, the formation of uh, Haustoria. These are special cells uh, with which they, uh, they attach to the hyphae of their host. Um, and this Trimella mesenterica, of course, as we've seen in the previous slides, they can form very fleshy, um, beautiful fruit bodies. But there are many species of Trimellomycetes uh, which don't form uh, fruit bodies anymore, and they just grow inside the hymenium of, uh, of their host species. Um, but that's um, not uh, what I would like to highlight tonight. Uh, tonight, I would like to show you something more about the diversity of mycoparasites in um, the subphylum Puccinium, Puccinium mycotina. Puccinium mycotina may sound familiar to you because of um, the plant parasitic uh, Puccinialis, so the, the uh, well-known rust fungi, which uh, make up about 8,000 species of this, of this subclass. Um, and actually, most species in the subclass are here in the Pixiniomycetes, uh, these plant parasites, and only a few hundred species are in these other classes, which are actually mostly very species poor. But in terms of ecology, they contain um, very interesting um, organisms, which are very often mycoparasites. And so far, mycoparasitism has been proven to exist in seven out of ten classes of uh, Puccinium mycotina. And my goal is to uh, show you some of them and um, show you which characters that they actually share and which, that, uh, which characters are unique for some groups. Uh, most species, they also have um, a dimorphic life cycle, just like the melomycetes. And this means that if you catch basidiospores of both, both the host fungus and the uh, parasites on agar surfaces, you can see here this um, is hyphae. This, this is actually a host fungus which hosts basidiospores, spores which start, start germinating. And here you can see yeast colonies. These are spores from the mycoparasites which start uh, budding yeast cells and forming yeast colonies. And this is actually a very efficient way how you can isolate these two interaction partners. And um, a third important thing, um, is that in Puccinium mycotina, we have um, two major types of interaction mechanisms between host and parasite. One group are the hostorium forming mycoparasites, and the second group is the colacosome forming mycoparasites. And um, here you can see just a quick uh, image of both types. So on the left, you have um, this is uh, a hostorium of. Uh, the uh, Spicologloria subminuta, which attaches to the much broader hyphae of um, its host fungus, Botryobasidium subcoronatum. This tiny wire here, I hope you can see my mouse, um, but this tiny, this tiny filament here is a hyphae of the mycoparasite, and you can see that it's much thinner than the hyphae of the host, which is um, here. And then on the right, you can see an example of uh, the colacosome interaction of, in this case, of colacogloria effusa and the host Peniophorella, um, Peniophorella pretermissa. And you can see here, um, there are this circle here. This is a hyphae of, uh, of the host Peniophorella, just like this circle here. And you can see it's surrounded by these black um, very like heart shaped or globular shaped structures and these are actually colacosomes which are formed by the mycoparasite and they um, penetrate actually the host cell uh, the cell wall of the host and they um, 
eventually they will kill the host. And it's a very curious interaction mechanism. Um, and this colacosome interaction, we, we can only uh, see it in a very limited set of um, genera. Many of these genera are also just monotypic, so just one species in this chain, uh, in one genus. And we only find it in microbotriomycetes and in cryptomycococolacomycetes. Uh, and actually, their discovery has only been made in the 1990s by um, the German mycologist uh, Franz Oberwinkler and his colleagues. Um, and they found it in uh, Platygloia peniophore. And based on the presence of this colacosome, so they didn't do um, genetic uh, analysis that time, but based on the presence of these interaction structures, they decided this is special enough to segregate the species from the genus uh, Platygloia, uh, which contains actually a very heterogeneous group of fungi. And they created the genus Colacogloia to accommodate um, the species. But I would like to show you that actually you don't always need to do um, electron microscopy to, to, uh, to find these structures. This is um, just bright field microscopy. And here you can see a little bit more how the interaction happens. So this is the arrows on the left picture. They indicate um, globular gall-like cells of uh, the parasite and all these conidiophores and conidia which are um, growing, this is all tissue of the parasite. And in some places you can see, uh, for example here, this is a host hyphae which grows into such a gall of uh, the parasite. And also here a host hyphae is growing inside and at the contact surface um, in this gall, all these colacosomes are formed and they are really very structured, like all soldiers standing in a row next to each other. Um, and they um, attack and penetrate um, the cell wall of the host, which grows inside the skull. And this is the ultrastructural view of it. Um, so here you can see this big structure here. Uh, this is um, this, such a gall structure produced by the mycoparasite and these two small circles. These are, um, this is twice the hyphae of the host which grows inside and is surrounded each time by these colacosomes. The species itself has actually been described very early. Um, this was uh, done by Bourdieu and Galzet, two French mycologists, and they, um, in their original description from 1909, um, they indicate that uh, it's actually growing on uh, two different hosts, on Peneo frappuberi and Gloeo cystidi pretermisi. Today, if you translate it into modern taxa, that's uh, Peneo frala pubera and Peneo frala pretermisa, two closely, two closely related um, crust fungi. You can see it here on the back. So you have again uh, a wooden branch which is decayed by the white fungus in the background, which is in this case uh, Peniofrella uh, pretermisa, and these yellow patches, which you see, um, this this is a mycoparasite. This is Colacogloia uh, effusa attacking or um, living from uh, the Peniofrella pretermisa. On the right here is the original drawing of the authors. Um, here you can see the hymenial layer, so the um, the host fungus down and this uh, mycoparasite is more or less growing in between and uh, forming these yellow patches uh, on top of it and in these yellow patches they produce their own basidia which are again transversely septate and um, basidia spores and conidia, uh, sex asexual conidia. Um, this is if you catch them on, uh, on uh, agar um, plates then you can uh, very easily separate the host and the parasite. And this mycoparasite um, is not only dimorphic in the growth pattern, so it changes from this filamentous hyphal stage in which is a, it's a parasite, it changes to this uh, saprotrophic yeast, sta yeast stage. So it's not only changing the morphology, it's also changing its nutritional ecology. So it uh, changes from a mycoparasitic ecology to saprotrophy. 
Uh, recently, we showed that um, Cola Cogloria pineophore was actually already published even um, many years before by uh, Schröter. Um, and that's why we pro uh, he descri Schröter pr uh, described the species as Platygloia uh, effusa, and that's why we uh, recently pronounced a new combination, Cola Cogloria effusa. So, um, and I, I actually did some uh, research into this group, and we found that it's a species complex, and we are, it's currently still um, under um, preparation, but we found at least eight different species within this group. Um, and probably the the real diversity of these uh, of these taxa is enormously high and and can go up to dozens of species. Another species I want to show you, which is also a colacosome interacting mycoparasite, is Acromyces insignis. Uh, here on the picture on the back you can see um, a mixarium species, also decaying again uh, uh, a branch of wood, and. Inside this mixarium species, there is um, um, again a, tr a mycoparasite growing. And on the left, uh, on the right, you can see the original drawing by the author Knut Hauerslev from Denmark. Again, this parasite has transversely septate uh, basidia. It's producing basidia spores and conidia. But um, in the original description, nothing is mentioned about um, the interaction mechanism between host and parasite, he only mentioned that he did not observe Hostoria. But that is because um, it's actually a colacosome interacting fungus. Uh, here I just want to show you that the original author, he mentioned that the conidia, the asexual spores, are um, uh, arthroconidia, just formed at hyphae, but that's actually not true. So with fluorescence microscopy, you can actually get a much better view on uh, the structure of these cells. And on the left picture, you can see these are very complex conidiophores, which are lopped. And each lop actually gives rise to a single conidium. On the right, you can see uh, a basidium, which has a distinct probasidium, which collapses. And um, the karyogamy actually happens in here. And then each daughter nuclei moves into one compartment of, uh, of the basidium. And this fluorescence microscopy method actually also allows to um, visualize the host parasite interaction. And here you can see it's about this structure here. And this is actually um, a host hyphae, which is completely surrounded. It's actually a spiraling hyphae of the mycoparasite, which goes completely around. And you can see that the contact interface is extremely bright and that is of the density of colaposomes which are being formed along the contact interface. And this is um, again the same. So there is one hyphae of the host gro uh, growing here, and it's completely surrounded by spiraling hyphae of the mycoparasite. And at the contact surface, colaposomes are formed at, uh, at, far at very high density. So, um, and if we want to place this in a phylogenetic perspective, both Colacogloria um, effusa and Acromyces insignis, they belong to the Microbotriomycetes, which actually belong, uh, contain also some uh, yeast species which form colacosomes. Um, and by adding these um, filamentous mycoparasites that we find in nature, uh, and by inserting them in these phylogenetic reconstructions, we actually can get a much better idea on the ecology of, um, of most of these organisms, which have only been isolated as yeasts from um, environmental samples. And there's a high probability that many yeast species in microbotriomycetes, um, but also in the other groups of, um, of Puccinio mycotina are actually the saprotrophic asexual stages of, uh, of mycoparasites. But of course, this is speculation, but it's at least something that we should keep in mind. One thing about colacosome forming fungi I want to uh, go give with you, um, because it's from British Mycological Society. This is an article from um, uh, based uh, on Kriegelsteinera lasiosferiae. It's a mycoparasite, a colacosome forming mycoparasite on Lasiosferia ovina, 
And it was Kerry Robinson, a British uh, hobby mycologist, who found this collection. And um, it's one of the best collections of the species that we actually know to date. And if you um, put them under the electron microscope, again, you can see here a hyphae of Lasiosphera of the ascomycete, which grows into a gall forming cell of the mycoparasite. And at the contact surface, you have individual colacosomes, which are um, here you can very clearly see that it's um, the penetrating the cell wall of this ascomycetes host. Now I just want to give you also some taste of uh, Hostoria forming fungi. Um, we, found, we find them in both Agarico mycotina and Puccinio mycotina, and there's even one genus, Higogloia, which we absolutely have no idea about where it belongs. Um, I want to show you the genus Piculogloia. It was described by a British mycologist, uh, Peter Roberts. He worked many years in Botanic Garden of Kew. Um, and he described the genus Piculogloia as a mycoparasite of um, uh, a hypoderma species from, uh, from Mallorca. And this is how it looks like. It's just the parasite only uh, com uh, comprises some hyphae some Hastoria and Basidia. And the Basidia are again transversely septated. And you can see that they are actually covered by very small spicules. And that's why he named the genus Spiculogloea because of the spiculated aspect of, uh, of the Basidia. Um, and currently there are five species described and they only share this character of spiculated Basidia. Uh, Basidia spores are only ra rarely formed or observed. They have a dimorphic life cycle, so they alternate between a uh, hyphae and a yeast stage. They form hostoria and they don't form, um, they don't form fruit bodies. They live inside the hymenium of their host fungus. Um, and that's why we call them intrahymenial. And both the hostoria and the intrahymenial lifestyle, they may be uh, adaptations to a mycoparasitic lifestyle. This is one example that we described from, uh, from Belgium. It's um, Spiculogloia inequalis. Again, it just consists of some hyphae. It's a parasite of this crust fungus here, Cystotrema oplongisporum. Um, here you can see on this picture that it's forming some, uh, some sterigmata out of the basidia. The basidia are transversely septate. And if you collect the basidia spores um, on an agar plate, they start, um, they switch to a saprotrophic lifestyle and they switch from the hyphal stage to the unicellular yeast stage. Um, again, uh, a second species in this genus is Piculogloria subminuta, was described from uh, Denmark. This is a host. Uh, it's Basidiodendron subcoronatum. It's one of the most common corticoid fungi uh, in Europe. It grows mostly on uh, Fagus. And here you can see the very broad hyphae of this host. And it's here completely covered, all these tiny hyphae. It's all uh, tissue of the mycoparasite, which completely um, surrounds the hyphae of the host. And you can see some individual hostoria attaching. Um, and these hostoria, uh, then they also penetrate the, um, the cell wall of the host and some uh, pores are formed in the size of nanometers. Uh, here you can see an, a, scanning, a scanning electron microscopic um, image of uh, the specimen. And uh, this is the original drawing of the author and also of the species. If you collect the spores on, uh, on agar, this uh, will switch again to this uh, unicellular yeast stage. And um, if you um, also use the uh, the genetic data of the Spiculogloia mycoparasites, um, then you will see that they end up in Spiculogloiomycetes, but also in Agaricosilvomycetes. So um, it may be that this, um, or it's actually true that this speculated uh, character of the Basidia, uh, it's not a, a good phylogenetic signal, so it's actually a poly polyphyletic genus. Um, and also in other groups of, um, like in the Pixiniomycetes itself, in the Cystobasidiomycetes, in the Classiculomycetes, in the Cryptomycococolacomycetes, 
they all contain uh, mycoparasites. I'm not going to show them, and it would take too much time. But uh, it's just to uh, give you an idea of how phylogenetically widespread these uh, mycoparasites are. And they morphologically, they look very simple. Um, but phylogenetically and morphologically, they are actually very diverse. This is this one genus, um, Zygogloria, also described by uh, the British mycologist Peter Roberts. We have no idea where it belongs. Um, it's a parasite of the very common fungus, um, Mixarium nucleatum. It's actually, this is Mixarium hyalinum. It's uh, one of the species within the species complex of Mixarium nucleatum. And this is the original drawing. And it's a very peculiar one because the basidia, they are extremely curving and winding. Again, they are transversely septate, as many other species in Puccinium micotina. Um, and the reason, um, what makes it even more special is that the conidiophores, as you can see here, they consist of two lids and they develop conidia. Each lid develops one conidium. Um, and the two conidia then finally merge and they are um, uh, they are released as um, actually as one entity. These are some uh, pictures, uh, microscopic pictures stained in floxina. Um, you can see here uh, very clearly this very uh, curving basidia. Um, it's only in very rare occasions that you can find them uh, producing uh, spores. Why that is, I, I have no idea. Um, here you can very clearly see uh, one hyphae of the Zygogloea, which is forming extensive um, hostoria, uh, which are all searching their way to hyphae of, uh, of the host fungus. And this is, uh, these are some better um, images of um, this um, conidia force, which consists of two lids. And here you can see the start of two freshly conidia, which are being born. And if you would look at the surface of the host species, um, this is uh, a, scanning electron, a scanning electron microscopic um, image of the surface of um, the host. And it's full, it's completely covered with this uh, Zigo conidia. Um, so you can see, you can very clearly see that each Zigo conidium consists of um, yeah, two, two sister cells. So to wrap up um, but, uh, mycoparasites and Basidium mycota, the uh, known species diversity is actually low. So we have roughly 200 species out of 41,500. But phylogenetically, they are very um, widespread over two subphyla, Agaricum mycotina and Puccinium mycotina, and they cover 13 classes. They are highly variable in morphology um, and Roughly two major interaction mechanisms are known, the Hostoria forming fungi, which are most diverse, and the colacosome interacting mycoparasites. They are restricted to um, the cryptomycocolacomycetes and the microbotriomycetes. Um, I would say, especially for hobby mycologists, um, make a challenge of it to go out in the field and um, find these fungi, uh, try to identify them and to help you um, there is a group of um, Flemish and Dutch uh, amateur mycologists, I'm one of them, um, and together we compiled identification keys for every single existing genus uh, of heterobasidiomycetes. Now you can find them uh, either on the website of the Dutch Mycological Society or the Flemish Mycological Society. Um, the links are in here and this is um, below is just a screenshot. And um, it's really helpful. It's uh, for the moment, most keys are only in Dutch, but it's a good opportunity to work on your Dutch. Um, but um, I can also say that um, gradually we are translating more and more um, keys into English as well to make them accessible for, um, yeah, for uh, the international public. So I think this is um, a great tool. Um, for, for anyone who is interested in identification of uh, crust fungi and jelly fungi, which often grow inside them. So 
also if you find something and you have difficulties to uh, to identify or you uh, want to know more about it i am very happy to um to receive specimens of these groups uh, and to investigate them um, so here you can find my coordinates um, and always you're very welcome to contact me with questions also for literature or for whatever you want to know about these things and i want to end with um, thanking some persons um, most of all the members of the fragmo project so the fragmo project is this group of people making this case without them my research would be impossible because um, it's so hard to find these mycoparasites, especially if they grow on inside their host. They are completely invisible and it's not possible to find them on your own or to find enough of them on your own. So I am very grateful to them. And then, of course, to my professor, supervisor, um, Professor Mika Verbeken and close collaborators, Professor Dominic Begero from uh, Hamburg University, Andre Jurkov from um, the uh, German Culture Collection in Braunschweig, uh, Vyacheslav Spiren from Helsinki, and Olivier Leroux, a colleague at Ghent University, uh, very specialized in uh, electron microscopy, and of course, uh, so many more people. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm ready to take questions, uh, should you have some. Thank you very much, Nathan. So anybody got any questions? Let's before put them in the chat facility and we will put them to Nathan now. Thank you, Nathan. That was um, amazing imagery there. I'm really fascinated by that. Thank you. Um, there is a question from Linda. Uh, Linda asks, are there more recent changes in how mycoparasites affect woodland ecology? Woodland ecology. Um, I would say for the moment we know actually very little about the ecological impact of, uh, of mycoparasites, especially of Basidiomycetes mycoparasites, because most of these species, we, we, they are only known from, from one or two or three collections, and it's basically impossible to, to infer something about their ecological impact. Um, but I think, especially in Microbotrium, I see it. So um, in the first presentation, um, uh, Laura told about um, uh, biocontrol of, uh, of um, certain pest species. And actually some of the yeast species that she found, which are very useful or very efficient in um, in controlling population of pathogens are very closely relatives of, um, of Basidiomycetes mycoparasites. And I think um, this gives some indication about um, their potential uh, ecological relevance and, and impact. But that's the best answer I think I can give for the moment on that question. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> um, there aren't any more questions at the moment. If you do have a question for Nathan, please put it up now. I'm going to ask all three of our speakers tonight if they would just um, switch on their videos. And if anybody has any further questions for any one of our speakers, um, please go ahead and pop them in the chat. No, I think everybody has been stunned into silence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, all three of you, Claudia, Nilu and Nathan, for such fascinating talks this evening. It's been really good of you to share your work. Yeah. Oh, has, there's one question come in now. Um, great talk. Thank you. This is for you, Nathan. Is, is any evidence of exploitation? Is there any evidence of exploitation in biocontrol? I think it's in a general question, a bigger point, it's a more general question, I think, about biocontrol. Um, okay. So uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question well. So if the question is if there are currently Basidiomycetes mycoparasites which are used for biocontrol, is that the question? I'll have to ask, I'll have to ask for clarification from the, from the person. Could you retype your question if possible? Renos. Uh, 
Uh, uh -huh. Thank oh. you. Oh, so, uh, yeah, can uh, you see? So the question, yeah. I'll just read the question for in case anybody can't see. Mm -hmm. It says, can we use mycoparasites to control fungal plant pathogens? For the moment, um, I would think yes, because um, there are publications, especially of the seeds, which are already being used for um, uh, for uh, control of certain, uh, certain spe pest species. I don't know by heart. But I know these publications exist mainly of Tremelomycetes. So, um, if you want to find examples about uh, the application of um, Basidiomycetes mycoparasites, you should uh, really look into literature of Tremelomycetes. Um, but I think in the future, it will become many, many more opportunities will arise from Puccinio mycotina as well, um, given their phylogenetic diversity. I think there will there could also be a huge diversity in uh, metabolites and in um, possible applications for them. Um, so for the moment, only in Tremelomyces, yes. Thank you. Um, and Linda asks, um, are Tremelomyces easy to grow and bulk up? Yeah, absolutely. So these yeasts, uh, um, there's a... Um, it, it depends on the phylogenetic group, like Tremelomycetes. And so as far as the species that I isolated myself, I, I can't speak about all Tremelomycetes, um, that would be a lie. But the species that I isolated in Tremelomycetes, they are very fast growing. Um, and I think you can very easily produce big quantities of them. On the other hand, uh, most species in um, Puccinio mycotina, they are very, very slowly growing. So that would be an, uh, an issue, of course, if, if it turns out that species from Puccinio mycotina have interesting properties, um, then we should really look into in which conditions we can improve uh, growth rates. Fantastic, thank you.